Hello, it's Anthony Chadwick from the World Webinar Vet, welcoming you to another episode of Vet Chat, the UK's number one veterinary podcast channel. I'm so privileged uh, to be able to run this channel and meet so many people who inspire me. Uh, we often, as you know, in, on the channel talk about um, important issues around sustainability and I'm really fortunate today to have Jeanette Castle on the line. Uh, Jeanette, good morning, good evening, queer morga, queer avant, whichever language we're listening in. I'm presuming most people will be doing English uh, and in fact, the Dutch probably don't want to hear me speaking Dutch. But of course, Jeanette, an Aussie, uh, but but by birth, uh, born in born in uh, the Netherlands. That's right. It's really good to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jeanette. And Jeanette is a small animal practitioner just outside of Brisbane, but has been incredibly passionate uh, for a long time about the environment and is the chair of VFCA, which is the Veterinarians for Climate Action. And Jeanette, I'd just like you to perhaps fill us in on, on some of the uh, background of how you've sort of become a vet and also uh, taken this particular area of sustainability of the climate crisis so seriously. And perhaps just before we start, love the background is probably our coolest background that we've had. So uh very um, First Nation Aboriginal Australian, I would guess. That's right. Yes, it's from Mornington Island up in the north. And um, we used to live there for a while when I was a child. So it's a very special painting for me. Yeah, it's beautiful. Anyway, tell us a little bit about the background, Jeanette, how you've come to be chair of the VFCA. Sure. Well, I grew up in a family that loved camping. My parents came from Europe and they were so happy to be around mountains and natural places with so many wild birds. And um, so we used to go camping as a family, sometimes for two or three weeks at a time um, with my five brothers and sisters. And we'd live very simply. And I just loved um, seeing the birds and uh, watching them and floating around in the creek and looking at the dragonflies. And um, it really instilled a very deep na love of nature for me. Um, and, of course, I loved animals and, and being a veterinarian suited me very well. I had a family. Um, I had four children. And when those children were young, I wanted to be home with them and established a small practice um, at home, actually. Um, and then gradually uh, that sort of grew and we now have the Greater Springfield Veterinary Group um, just outside of Brisbane, which we have 50 staff now, and uh, they actually work very hard to free me up to devote myself, myself to veterinarians for climate action. So it might surprise you to hear that um, I haven't been particularly active in this space um, until the last four to five years. I um, have always loved the environment, but I didn't really understand what was going on because like very many of us, I was busy, you know, raising my family, um, looking after animals, doing surgery, doing calls at night and thinking that I might end up being a, a close to full-time advocate for climate action was as far from my mind as probably having a practice with 50 staff was. So... Um, I, I did start to become concerned five or six years ago about um, mining of coal and uh, joined some protests. And, and I just realised I was actually a lousy protester. I, I'm not very good at, um, at, at, at protesting, um, but I am probably okay at inspiring and influencing people. So I met with... Um, who was the chair of Farmers for Climate Action, I was introduced and I said, well, maybe I can give you a bit of a hand, you know, with your climate work with farmers, thinking maybe that was something I could do. And they said to me, well, what about um, you start veterinarians for climate action and then the veterinarians and the farmers can work together. So Farmers for Climate Action Australia is now the fourth most um, uh, influential uh, environmental charity in Australia and it does a lot of incredible work to bring the agriculture uh, sector, you know, to reduce its emissions and um, to advocate for change, uh, which is great. So then I had this idea of perhaps starting Vets for Climate Action, um, put out a Facebook post, a number of people got back. We held a brainstorming session here at home for a day 
um, with a number of people to try and figure out what it was that we could do. Uh, and from there, we've established quite a strong strategic plan. Which I read, Jeanette, and is very impressive, I suppose. And I, I know you've been in contact with uh, Vet Sustain. There's obviously groups all over the world coming together, and it's the power of small groups can actually make big change as well, can't they? Absolutely. I mean, in Australia, I know that all around the world we're experiencing difficulties as a result of climate change, but in Australia we are experiencing a number of areas of great concern. You might remember in 2019-20 the horrific bushfires that spread across Australia. Um, millions and millions of hectares of land were burnt and three billion animals uh, either were killed, burnt alive, that means, or displaced in those fires. And when they're displaced, I mean, displaced animals often don't come back. So, you know, the impact of that, the distress to veterinarians, I mean, I've been a clinical veterinarian for 31 years, and um, I would have a little weep with every client that lost one pet, you know, with them. I would feel sad with them. So the idea that three billion animals perished in a space of a few months in just one country around the world was extremely distressing for veterinarians. And we'd already started Vets for Climate Action by then, but it was mobilising for us as well. As well as that event, um, we, we'd we had a long drought in the north of Australia, um, very long drought. And that's an area, you know, it's a tropical area with seasonal rains um, and uh, there's cattle... Uh, up there in the north, in the far north. And uh, so the, the livestock were weakened by um, the drought. And then there was this extreme rainfall event um, causing extreme flooding. And the animals that didn't drown died of cold exposure. And 600,000 head of cattle perished in that event. So the animal welfare implications of that is horrendous. So, you know, even from, a, from an economic perspective, 600,000 head of cattle is, is phenomenal. We also, um, you know, veterinarians are often, we often think about, you know, small animal or clinical practice, but we're very involved with biosecurity as well. And uh, diseases in Australia, such as Japanese encephalitis, that were only ever seen in the Torres Strait, um, recently was found in South Australia, in the very south causing abortions and stillbirths in pig herds there and really impacting pig herds in the south of Australia. We also have concerns about vector spread with cyclonic weather potentially bringing lumpy skin disease into Australia, which is a huge animal welfare issue and an economic issue. Um, and Japanese encephalitis is a one health issue. So, you know, all of these areas, extinctions, one health, biosecurity, animal welfare, animal production, um, you know, fertility um, and the economy are all in the wheelhouse of veterinarians around Australia. So those are the impacts that we've been feeling. I remember, Jeanette, when I was uh, thinking about becoming a vet and, and training to be a vet and people would say, oh, you know, you care about animals more than people. But of course, even at that stage 40 years ago, I realised that everything is connected um, yes. But if we are to be stewards of creation and to look after the animals, if we don't look after them, then there will be a, an effect on us down the road. And obviously we yes. see this with uh, some of the events now. Obviously animals are suffering, but people are suffering and the environment suffering. Yes, and even, right. as you said, with the biodiversity, if you've got three billion animals dying in a fire, that, that will probably lead to some local extinctions. I mean, you're probably your most... Um, enigmatic species or one of them would be the koala bear and i know how much they mm. they suffered because they they moved slowly and, and were burnt in the fires and mm. at our veterinary green discussion forum recently we were hearing about um siva who are actually providing chlamydia vaccines for koalas because oh, terrific chlamydia yes. is becoming more prevalent again yes. because of the increased temperatures so all of these things are as you say connected and and yeah. If we want to bundle them into one word, we'd probably say one health, wouldn't we? Yes, that's right. That's right. And Australia did have the first mammalian in extinction as well as a result of the bushfires. 
Mm. I mean, I I think what really got me going was when I realised that 70% of the world's wildlife has disappeared since I was a five-year-old girl. So when I was a five-year-old girl swimming around in that creek with my family enjoying the birds, seven out of ten animals around the world, wildlife around the world are no longer with us and this earth is millions of years old. So, you know, we need to make changes and we need to make them quickly, which is why we've established veterinarians for climate action. Well, Kate Grant talked about this year, who she's the CSO of Google, and she talked about this being a decisive decade. And, yes. you know, I think you're right. We, we need to start turning the ship around and we need to start doing it Absolutely. pretty quickly, don't you think? Interesting you were talking about the birds because I uh, lived very much in urban Liverpool in the centre of Liverpool. And when I was a little boy, we would walk up the street and we had beautiful Dutch elm uh, trees, uh, yes. elm trees in the in the road, and of course Dutch elm disease came across and killed a lot of the trees. Um, and at that stage, we would see sparrows fighting on the pavement. You know, they'd argue; they're a little argumentative bird. And um, I used to be woken up by the the sound of sparrows singing. And then, you know, I I go back to my road now where I was brought up and there are no sparrows. And in fact, in my lifetime in the UK, we reckon we've lost 50 million sparrows. Um, And as a little bit of hope, I I now live uh, a little bit further out by the beach and never seen sparrows in the garden until the last 12 months, 18 months. And that's taken probably five to 10 years of me encouraging bird life back into my quite small garden. But Yes. The beauty is that if we give nature a, a chance, it, it can actually back. regenerate very quickly, can't it? That's right. Absolutely. Obviously, it's really interesting. You know, you said in 2019, the terrible fires. And of course, climate change has rather unfairly affected the global south more than the global north, although most of the carbon that's emitted comes from Europe and America, which is in the north. Um But we're now seeing that also in Europe, we've had the terrible bushfires in in Europe in places like Greece. And I was um, at a conference, an education conference, talking about the fires in Canada. Uh, Mm. They've had their worst ever fire season this year. So the North is starting to see what the South saw 10, 20 years ago is starting to come to the North now. Stat I saw 160 billion tonnes of carbon emitted into the atmosphere as the trees in, in Canada have burned. So mm. it is a it is a really difficult situation. But um, obviously, also as a man of hope, and I know you're a woman of hope as well, we, we have to move forward. And I'm really impressed with all the work that VFCA is doing. Thank but you. perhaps tell me tell me a little bit about the pillars um, about some of the successes that you've had in encouraging vets and perhaps some of the bigger businesses, some of the pharmaceutical businesses and the, the feed businesses to just think a bit differently because we're a huge client for the big pharmaceutical firms as well. And we have we have a power that perhaps collectively or as individuals we don't recognise. That's right. Um, I might explain to you our strategic plan. So we have a very clear strategy. And if you were to look on the Vets for Climate Action uh, strategic plan on, on the internet, you can read it for yourself. But we have three pillars that we're focusing on. The first is education. So we're shifting the culture of our veterinary profession in Australia initially to be thinking about sustainability and climate across the veterinary curriculum across veterinary conferences, we're delivering masterclasses, Um, uh, we're involved in courses. One of the really key educational components is our climate care program, which is a um, six module program to reach sustainability and ultimately um, net zero for the veterinary profession. So each practice has a climate champion and deliver across six different areas, including water use, um, waste, uh, energy, procurement, and chemical use. So, I mean, um, that has been launched this year, 
and we're really looking forward to the uptake of that growing over time so that it becomes normal, just like we have mental health plans in the workplace now. You know, 15 years ago, we were starting to talk about mental health and taking care of our people in a better way. And now this is the new conversation that we need to have to round everything out. Yeah. So um, the climate care program is a big part of um, of vet, vets for climate actions work, um, and we also have an interest in focusing the climate care program in areas where there's less understanding of climate change. So you know it's easy to confuse climate change and sustainability. Climate change is because there's a warm blanket being created around the earth because of you know the, the release of fossil fuels, um, the release of carbon from fossil fuels and sustainability is like we're all on a spaceship there's only so many resources to go around and we need to use them wisely so they're two sort of separate issues that dovetail in together um, but where we're at with climate change at the moment if you can imagine the ice ages they occurred you know over a very long period and in the ice ages we had about five degrees of cooling so that meant that you know you could walk between Australia and Papua New Guinea across ice um, because there was huge changes geological changes as um, ge um, climactic changes as a result of the ice age um, in the last short period since our use of fossil fuels we're already in reverse about um, you know, uh, just just under um, a third of the way to an ice age, at least a quarter of the way to an ice age in reverse. And that's very concerning that that's happened so incredibly quickly. So uh, that's why we need to all get busy. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of people around the world that are focusing on this work. So uh, that's very important. So the first strategic pillar is education. Uh, the second is collaboration. So we would love to collaborate internationally. We're collaborating with our veterinary associations, our veterinary business associations, our nursing associations with the New Zealand veterinarians. Um, we'd like to collaborate with zoos and the RSPCA moving forwards so that we can share this message publicly of impacts on our animals and what needs to be done. And the third third pillar of our strategic plan is for us to act as trusted advisors. So we work very closely with a group of 34 retired chief veterinary officers and senior government officers, veterinary officers, and they do a lot of writing and research for us. We have a document called Climate Facts for Veterinarians. They also write letters that we then send to the Prime Minister. So we sent a letter to the Prime Minister today and um, to a number of other ministers, state and federal, regarding uh, proposed fracking of the Beetaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. And next week, a large group of veterinarians and doctors, a very large group, will be going to Canberra, visiting Parliament House and talking to parliamentarians about the Beetaloo Basin, the direct impacts on human and animal health and the indirect impacts of feeding climate change through opening these sorts of um, operations. And, yeah. you know, we as, a, a, as humanity need to stop um, as soon as we can these sorts of things. So, you know, advocacy together with people who have a powerful vo voice is, you know, is a really, um, really useful thing. I mean, in Australia, we used to go to the supermarket and bring all our groceries home in plastic bags and everybody just did that. And then probably not that big a number advocated to say, we can't do that anymore. We need to be recycling plastic bags. And now you wouldn't think to go to the supermarket without your plastic bags so you know advocacy and education is so important with COVID you know the Prime Minister would stand there with the graph and say we need to you know limit this growth we need to make sure it's not exponential and the Prime Minister explained very carefully together with the Chief Medical Officers what the situation was and the people understood and they acted and that saved so many lives. So yeah. I guess education and advocacy and collaboration are really, really important parts of what we do. We're very honoured to have on our board um, Professor Mark Howden, um, who's a Vice Chair of the IPCC and the Director of the Climate Institute of Australia. So we have some people, it's very humbling to me, 
um, who believe that what we are doing is worthwhile and people who have a lot of other things that they could do with their time that that spend time with us and um, as a profession. And uh, that's very humbling for me and also very encouraging because I'm sure the listeners, I'm sure you're just like me, actually, I'm not qualified to do this. I'm not qualified to chair a board. I'm not qualified to uh, be an advocate or to speak to politicians. Um, I'm a veterinarian by qualification with some leadership skill. And, um, you know, but we have to get out of our comfort zone and have a crack, don't we? You know, and, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, help each other on this journey. And it is a journey. You know, our practice will, I hope, soon be the second carbon neutral registered practice in Australia. Um, we can all get to carbon neutral and then ultimately, you know, the hope would be that we won't need to buy carbon yeah, credits. But but this is this is a journey. Yeah. I'm on the journey. You know, I'm not there yet. Um, we're figuring it out and we're doing that together. And I think that's incredibly important. Did you know the Webinar Vet has a public community Facebook group? We want to ensure veterinary professionals have a place to stay in the loop with everything that's happening here at the Webinar Vet. In this public group, you can chat and network with other veterinary professionals from across the globe, get exclusive updates, content recommendations, and so much more. Pop and say hello to a community of over 2,000 veterinary professionals by searching the Webinar Vet community on Facebook. Jeanette, I think it's really important for our listeners to realise that they have a powerful voice in that as a veterinary practice, um, we will often be buying um, pharmaceuticals, we'll be buying disposables, that perhaps uh, how they're made, also food as well. I think we do have a power to talk to some of the bigger companies and say, we want you to move quicker. I think there's some companies that are doing a lot, some maybe not so much. This is where I think in the end, we can encourage the ones who are doing more by buying more from them and then encouraging the other ones to do more because we're stopping buying from them. What, what, what are your thoughts on procurement? Yeah, I completely agree. So one of the modules um, in in our climate care program is a procurement module, and uh, that hasn't been released yet. That's one of our later modules. Um, but I'm just imagining that um, across the profession that we could all all be asking the same questions of our of our industry um, companies. You know, asking, well, what's your net zero target? What are you doing towards your net zero target? What's your biodiversity impacts? What are you doing about that? You know, where are you now? We're all on a journey, but where are you and where do you intend to be soon? And I feel that if everybody, um, you know, uh, in a structured way is asking those same sorts of questions over time internationally, that has a very big impact. So my practice turns over about $6 million dollars. And in that practice, um, 20% is cost of goods. So that's what we spend. So for every dollar that we make, we spend about $20 on drug bills and, you know, buying stuff. So, um, you know, in my practice, that's $1.2 million in buying power. I think that's quite substantial for one, you know, one small group. Uh, So, you know, I've already made choices in terms of the products that I purchase based on um, sympathy for veterinarians for climate action, interest in veterinarians for climate action, and more importantly, where the companies have targets in place. So that's the sort of way that, you know, we can have an impact on our industry by thinking carefully around what we buy, just as, as we wouldn't purchase from companies that use slave labour. You know, we wouldn't do that. Uh, we also shouldn't be buying from companies that have no concern for the environment. So we are all on this journey together. So there's a bit of carrot and a bit of stick, but um, hopefully more carrot. Um, But I do think that we have a great deal more power than what we think we do. Ultimately, I'm a very small person with a big idea. um, And I found that, you know, we all have a lot more power than we think we do in ourselves to make a change. And I think it's interesting within the big companies, 
they're often made, well, they are all made up of individual people who, some of whom will be very passionate about the environment, some of whom aren't. But actually, even, you know, a lot of the companies are trying to move um, to a more um, sustainable and a more eco environmentally friendly space. So if we're encouraging them, if we need to cajole a bit, then we can, but encouragement always works Absolutely. best, doesn't it? And sharing. I mean, the Australian Veterinary Association now has a very, very strong and um, comprehensive policy on animal health, welfare, production and climate change. It's a fantastic policy, you know, and once you have policies in place, then you're obliged to act on them. So, you know, um, even at that level, it's important to get to get those things right because that's sort of your guiding document then uh, for any organisation or company. We're also very uh, fortunate in, in the UK in that our soon-to-be BVA president is a big advocate of she is. the environment, uh, Anna Judson. Yes. Uh, and also the uh, RCBS president, Sue Patterson, is also very interested in the environment. They were both at the Veterinary Green Discussion Forum. So I think yeah. um, there are reasons for hope, aren't there? And I know we all use different analogies. I often talk about the Titanic took a long time to turn, and that was part of its problem, but we need to turn the ship much more quickly. I know I, I use... Um, I use ships as an analogy. I believe you use trains as an analogy for how we should be uh, moving quickly in climate change. Perhaps to finish, explain about uh, the train analogy. Yeah, it's quite a nice analogy um, that was given to me recently. Um, so we can imagine that there's this train coming our way and it's rattling along very, very, very fast. And uh, we can choose to say there's no train coming, stand on the track and say, no, no train's coming. There's no train coming. It's not going to come. But the train's going to get you. Or you can turn your back on the... So that's turning your back on the train, I guess. Or you can look at the train and you can be so paralysed by this train coming your way that you go, oh, there's nothing I can do. My feet are rooted here and there's I'm stuck. Um, yeah. You could also perhaps try and get into the driver's seat of the train and slow that train right down put the brakes on the train. That's a very important one. If you're standing on the train track, you've got to think about what side of the train track are you going to hop off? Are you going to hop off on the side where um, the adaptation to what's inevitable is occurring or are you going to hop on the side where there's no adaptation and the situation is worse again? So I guess the message is we need to get on the, on the driver's seat of that train and slow it down and if we're standing in front of the train we need to face towards it we need not to be paralyzed by it and we need to climb off the tracks in a way that facilitates good at adaptation to climate change and I think that that's a that was a, a message that I found helpful and I see veterinarians for climate action as a um, you know creating a fence at the top of the cliff rather than being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff so, you know, we, yeah. as veterinarians, really want to look after things, um, but we've really got to get to the top of the cliff and put some guardrails up, and that's reducing emissions globally. That's our job, um, together with the whole planet, really. All of humanity needs to drop emissions this decade. This is the critical decade. We all just need to get started. We need to get on that journey. Yeah. And I'd encourage you to get on the journey with us, to join Vets for Climate Action, um, just just join and receive our newsletters. That that would be very encouraging to us. Um, and, and my message is always don't get depressed, get active. Uh, that's what we need to do. Yeah, don't get depressed, get active. And stay hopeful because I think we can... Absolutely. We, we can slow this train down. Yes. And we all have something, yeah? We have time or we have money or we have influence or we have contacts you know we all have a way of of contributing and um resolving this problem together so we need to use what we have absolutely Jeanette one of um, my things I'm trying to push this year is to encourage vets to put solar panels on the roof because it's a very easy way and it's becoming more um, fantastic 
economically viable as well with the the increase in in fuel costs that it it, it gives us more security but actually if we have the money to put solar panels on our roof it has a massive uh, impact as well so there are yeah, definitely perfect. things that we can do and yeah it's so important that we do take action because otherwise we are in a on a sticky wicket to use an ashes uh analogy having just managed to draw with you guys after being two nil down we were very pleased in the uk at the moment <laughs> well done Jeanette. thank you so much for for taking time it's uh it's a pleasure it's a privilege to do this podcast i get to speak to really inspirational people like yourself so thank you for all the fantastic work that you're doing you're very welcome Thanks everyone for listening and hope to hear you soon on, see you soon on another podcast. This is Anthony Chadwick and this was Vet Chat. Take care. Bye-bye.